Okay. Yeah, we left off uh, on this one in the first video. And now moving on here, uh, talking about monks and that Theravada Buddhism is a religion for monks. Uh, so to so move forward here, um, Theravada monks called bhikkhus, uh, they're the only ones in Theravada Buddhism that can actually obtain nirvana, or in other words, release from uh, the cycle of samsara, reincarnation. Uh, and we'll talk about what nirvana is later on. Uh, but uh, so the lay people, the common people, uh, they they can't do that. Uh, and so, but they, the monks are the focus of the common person's religious practice. So uh, everything has to do with taking care of the monks and seeing they have what they need to practice uh, their the religion and obtain enlightenment. So their primary religious work is to support those monks. And uh, so, um, you know, and they do that. Monks go out a certain time of the day and they beg. People give them food. They People can offer them offerings. And uh, the temples uh, that we saw pictures of and things, they're usually uh, built by wealthy people that uh, want to honor a certain group of monks and so forth. Uh, but to be a monk, you, you go through an ordination process. Uh, the shaved head is a common indicator and putting on the orange robes, uh, which, uh, you know, differentiates them when they're out in public uh, with uh, people. You see a couple of them here. This one picture was taken by my son in uh, Cambodia. Um, the, you have to take the vow to follow the 10 precepts. Uh, so uh, this is a major part of the major teachings of uh, Buddhism, uh, which uh, this is the Buddhists have to follow the 10 precepts. Common people are expected to, to follow at least five of them. Uh, we'll talk, here's what those precepts are. Uh, one, not to take a life. Two, not to steal. This is, sounds familiar, doesn't it? Not to commit sexual immorality. So if you look at, you know, 10 commandments, you know, you're looking at some of the similar teaching. Uh, not to lie, same in the Ten Commandments. Not to drink intoxicating beverages, that's not uh, in the Ten Commandments, but uh, we are warned against, uh, you know, not to get drunk. Um, not to eat in excess after or after noontime. Uh, that's, that's pretty specific, isn't it? And then not to attend entertainment. An example of this would be dancing, singing, dramas. Uh, so these are considered kind of attachments to the world that you want to get away from to really achieve enlightenment. Not to decorate one's yourself or use cosmetics. Not to sleep in a high or wide beds. Uh, that would be a tough one for me. I, I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, And uh, not to touch any gold or silver. Uh, meaning, you know, they stay away from, uh, uh, you know, trying to be wealthy and things like that. And uh, so those are the 10 precepts that are part of when they take their vow that they they say, I will do these things. And what you find is a lot of these, uh, the monks, they, they sleep in a small room with a small bed and their life is rather rather austere in the sense they don't have any kind of ornamentation, things like that, uh, because they're supposed to be spending most of their time in meditation. But because they know they need food and the normal things of life, they do get those things by going out and uh, begging. All right, so uh, uh, part of their life is they usually live in groups in monasteries, uh, and they spend most of their day in meditation. Uh, there's a video on YouTube I found. I don't know if I put it in here anywhere, but uh, uh, the day in the life of a, a young monk uh, and it gives you a feel for what they go through. But you can see here meditating and then, you know, here they're getting food. People are giving them food as they're out uh, begging. Um, so, but most of the day is in meditation uh, uh, and 
meditating on the total impermanence of all existence. In other words, this life is just a cycle of birth and death, birth and death, and it's impermanent, and, and you want to get out of it, uh, and, you know, it's changing, and it's full of suffering, and for a Buddhist perspective, uh, the world, the cycle of reincarnation, you're always stuck in the cycle of coming back into a world that's full of suffering. Uh, so they focus on to avoid the distractions of this in, uh, this world. Uh, in morning time is their time usually to go out and uh, uh, beg for food. And uh, so, uh, but their main purpose is to uh, attain a full realization. Uh, is, uh, they, if they do, he's called a holy man or or hot. And... Uh, uh, and it, death, he, he will enter nirvana. Uh, and uh, but our hot is different from uh, the, you know Buddha, who is perfect in all in all his incarnations. Uh, uh, a heart uh, is not necessarily uh, uh, perfect. So, uh, but. Uh, that that's part of the process of going th through their meditation and so forth. So uh, Buddhas, there's been 25 uh, Buddhas. And uh, um, so these are ones who have attained enlightenment. Uh, if you think of all the centuries that have gone by, that's not very many uh, people who have actually attained Buddhahood. Uh, but all came to teach the same way of enlightenment. Uh, the idea emerged that there is a Buddha in the final stages of preparation to come to earth. Uh, this, uh, this was called Maitreya. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, so it's, uh, he will usher in this golden age of enlightenment. Uh, and, uh, you have this term Bodhisattva. Uh, he's a, a Buddha in the making. So this special Buddha who's uh, in the final stages of preparation is a Bodhisattva. He's a Buddha in the making, but hadn't gotten here yet. Uh, and they don't know when, but he's supposed to usher in an age of enlightenment. It's almost like a Messiah figure, it seems to be. Uh, but... Uh, uh, the, you have Buddhas in the making besides this one as well. And we'll talk about them uh, later on. All right. Uh, you have secondary participants, uh, in which uh, for uh, uh, this is uh, the goal is to just live a good life. Uh, and that's, you know, your laity, the people who can't, can't be, be monks. Uh, they follow the first five precepts and uh, you know, sometimes uh, on special occasions they'll practice the first eight and uh, so the idea of course comes in the idea of karma and uh, when you do the good deeds more to good deeds than bad deeds in other words karma is your action it's not like fate you know uh, we talk about well somebody, something happens somebody said well that, that's karma is it, but is it, in Buddhism, karma ha, is not your fate. Uh, you know, it's not predetermined. Uh, it's actually an action, and and uh, so so in that respect, your actions are either towards the positive side, good things, or bad things. Uh, and uh, so. So this effect of your karma or reaction is known as vipaka. Uh, those, uh, it points out that those who have bad karma, generally uh, they're the ones performing bad deeds, uh, will receive bad vipaka. Likewise, those who perform good deeds will receive good vipaka. And the more good vipaka, you know, the effects of your good deeds uh, will help you move upward in the cycle of reincarnation. Uh, and uh, it may even earn you some time in a state of bliss between incarnations, it's uh, said. 
So the universe itself consists of many levels and higher levels are states of bliss worthy of pursuing, but not nirvana, which is the final release. Uh, so there are, by having good karma, good deeds and so forth, you can enjoy some bliss between the times of reincarnation yeah, in Buddhism. Um, uh, so when we talk about uh, uh, the main obligations uh, for, uh, for them uh, in, in practicing uh, Buddhism, I seek refuge in Buddha uh, and uh, and I seek refuge in Dharma, duty, following the teachings of uh, Buddhism, in other words. And then uh, third, I seek uh, refuge in Sangha, uh, order of the bhikkhu monks, in other words. And so uh, as part of the practice of following Buddhism for the, the, for the non-monks is to uh, recitation of the uh, three uh, uh, refuge uh, refuges. Uh, so, and the other thing is for them to care for the monks, the bhikkhu, uh, with food, material clo for clothing, and other necessities of life. Uh, but nothing, no, nothing extravagant or extra. Uh, just the necessities of life. Uh, they also are to care for the temples. Uh, these I mentioned earlier are usually erected by the people, lay people. Uh, often, you know, no generous donors will help give to build the, the temple or a uh, statue. Uh, uh, you know, uh, will, will be built of Buddha, or they sometimes go have a statue honoring the person who's contributing the. Uh, money for building the building. Uh, traditionally uh, contributed by buying gold leaves to be added to a statue of the Buddha. And so the laity can participate in this by buying little pieces of what they can afford to be added to the uh, temple. All right, so uh, uh, the, if we look at Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, Buddha's in the making, uh, you'll notice that they often have multiple hands, like this picture over here. Uh, and, uh, you know, and they, where the hands are, uh, the position of the hands, the multiple hands um, are a meaning of power and strength. Uh, but when you see them with like with two hands, you'll find that sometimes the left hand is open on the lap right hand directed to the earth, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, these directions of the hands and how they are depends, you know, is a way of describing a particular aspect of the Buddha. And, uh, and so uh, the, this particular one, left hand open on the lap, right hand directed to the earth, it's calling on the earth to witness to his Buddhahood and steadfastness. Uh, there's a teaching position, a protecting position, uh, those kind of things. So when you look at a Buddha and you notice where the hands are, that can tell you something about what that particular Buddha is supposed to be representing, which thing he is uh, uh, representing for the people. And uh, as far as uh, practical uh, following of uh, Theravada Buddhism, uh, a lot of... Uh, Common folks, they've deified Buddha and actually do worship him, although he didn't consider himself a god. And, uh, but uh, he has attained a godlike position. And in Mahayana Buddhism, which we'll see later, he actually is deified. And, uh, but even Theravada Buddhists, uh, common folk oftentimes uh, worship him like a god. Uh, and uh, but knowledgeable people who are you know very knowledgeable in their in Buddhism and follow Buddhism uh, would not claim that uh, that they would worship him. 
Um, but what they everybody wants to do is they want to store up merit. Uh, and uh, and so, uh, you know, so if you store up enough merit and through reincarnation, maybe one day you may become a bhikkhu, uh, a monk. Uh, there are rite of passages uh, in puberty rites uh, in uh, Buddhism that are practiced as well. All right, well, um, that uh, will bring us over to uh, uh, Mayana uh, Buddhism, and we'll start looking at that. Uh, the, this is the big raft. I uh, hope that's big enough. But uh, uh, so, which was what Mayana means, big raft, because it accommodates a larger number of people monks and laity so Mahayana buddhism was that what we saw earlier the, the some were not happy with theravada buddhism as it was so narrow that it only applied to monks and over the years it, the split occurred like we said in uh, 200 uh, bc and uh, so uh, so Mahayana buddhism and the thing about Mahayana buddhism there's a lot of different forms of it and we'll talk about some of the major ones, but there are multitudes of them. And so I uh, can't possibly talk about them all. And uh, so uh, some of the innovations of Mayana Buddhism, there is Sunyata, it's called, the void, uh, is uh, interpreted as absolute compassion. Benevolent compassion is the ultimate multi motivating force of Mayana Buddhism. In other words, they're saying, for monks, they had to meditate their way out of uh, the cycle of reincarnation. For Mayana Buddhism, in various aspects of it, depending on the type, but overall, uh, if you can live a life of compassion, and that's your ultimate uh, uh, way of living, uh, that you can, through various aspects of whichever form of Mayana Buddhism you're following, you can get released from the cycle of reincarnation and enter into bliss. And in some cases, it's almost like some kind of heaven similar to uh, Christian heaven, but not quite. Uh, but as opposed to Theravada Buddhism, which is your release from samsara, uh, you'll cease to exist. And so there's some differences there. And then uh, there are multiplication of divine beings involved in Mahayana Buddhism as we'll see in a minute. Uh, the Lotus Sutra and other scriptures become very important in Mayana Buddhism. Uh, and there are it's multiple good. of uh, Buddhism. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, we almost do our first break. Oh, is it getting that time? What's that? Did you say something, Christian? All right. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, the doctors have arrived for uh, Christian. So, all right. So, um, so you got these uh, mo innovations of uh, uh, Mahayana Buddhism with the multiplication of divine beings, multiple Buddhas, and Bajhistavas. Um, and, uh, uh, you have what uh, are uh, called uh, Manushi Buddhas. They achieved enlightenment on earth, uh, uh, died and in Nirvana. So now they're not accessible. So these, these Buddhas are not accessible for people to learn from. Uh, and they're not here for people to be taught by. Uh, you have uh, Dhyana, Dhyani uh, Buddhas. Uh, they have attained enlightenment in heaven, uh, but they haven't died yet and are accessible. Uh, examples of this are Amitabha uh, of the Pure Land uh, type of Mahayana Buddhism. And uh, so these Bodhishtavas, as they're called, Buddhas in the making that we mentioned earlier, in Mahayana Bo mythology, these are divine beings in heaven who forgo entry into nirvana. Uh, until the last soul is redeemed from 
hell is the way it is, but hell is more of the idea, not like Christian, Jewish, uh, Christian uh, teaching or Islamic teaching, which uh, it's more of a lower levels of incarnation. Uh, but they are available in heaven, but uh, because they have a lot of merit stored up to assist people in need. Uh, well, you'll see this with the multiple heads on the, the images and multiple arms uh, showing their power uh, and uh, their wisdom and their ability to help. Uh, you have uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, you got the Dalai Lama, you may have heard of. Uh, he is the uh, head, spiritual head uh, of uh, uh, that's part of Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, Vajrayana, the third split, third major split is often seen as. Uh, and uh, he's considered a living Buddha of compassion. Uh, and so uh, he renounces nirvana in order to help mankind. And so, uh, so when you hear about the Dalai Lama, he's considered the incarnation. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, he, uh, and so he's a living Buddha in Tibetan uh, uh, type of Mahayana Buddhism. All right, so uh, here's an example. This is uh, Sakyamuni Buddha, uh, who is not accessible uh, to him, but over here you have Amitabha Buddha of compassion, who, who is accessible. Uh, and uh, uh, so those are just a couple of examples. But then uh, you have uh, uh, Avalokit. Sarvara Buddha Madhishtava, uh, who has uh, foregone entry into Nirvana and uh, notice the multiple arms here as well. And uh, this one's available to help you out. Uh, Avalokitesvara, uh, who is the consort uh, as well. So you do get the feeling of uh, some mix of Hindu gods, but these are just Buddhas in the making uh, and Buddhas who have foregone going into Nirvana. And so, uh, so uh, Mahayana Buddhism, here's an example of some of the sutra uh, there, the, uh, the Lotus Sutra uh, and scriptures. Uh, with the split with Mahayana Buddhism, uh, there is a proliferation of uh, writings uh, related to uh, Mahayana Buddhism. So the Lotus Sutra group of writings is has the highest stature in Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, the core teachings are attributed to Buddha Gautama uh, Buddha, but uh, uh, Sakyamuni which means sage of the Sakaya clan uh, that differentiates him from other Buddhas. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, a lot of Buddhas will, you know, attribute all the writings to that. Uh, Sakayamuni was a manifestation of the true celestial Buddha. And uh, uh, all human beings uh, in Mahayana Buddhism have the potential to reach Buddhahood. And so this is what probably the main distinction between Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism. Only monks can reach it, enlightenment uh, in Theravada, others can reach it in uh, Mahayana, but it depends on the particular type of Mahayana Buddhism, uh, what is involved in all of that. Uh, and they have uh, the scriptures re reference uh, specific Buddhas and Vodhishtavas by name in these writings. And the, the writings assert that Hinayana, or what's called Theravada Buddhism, as we're using here, is only for selfish, uncaring people. So there's some reaction in their writings uh, on Mahayana Buddhism in the Lotus Sutras. Uh, 
that was derogatory towards the narrowness of Theravada Buddhism. Uh, some innovations, uh, there are a lot of different schools, so it's not like Theravada Buddhism. You have this one school of Theravada Buddhism, uh, uh, the traditional one, um, but you have what's called the Tendai, which is the rationalist uh, side of uh, Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, several of these, one is called Pure Land, uh, meaning compassionate. Zen, in, which is focused on the intuitive, and Nichiren, which is more focused on chanting. Uh, that's the rationalist side. Uh, you know, on the other side, uh, you have the uh, Vajrana, which is the uh, same as Lamist, Lamist uh, of Tibet, uh, or Tibetan uh, Mahayana Buddhism. You have uh, the group called the Shingong, which is a uh, combination of Tendai and this uh, Vajrayana. And then you got the Roy Bu, uh, which is a combination of Shinto and Shingon. And uh, so you notice you can get very complicated in the different branches of, uh, uh, of Mahayana Buddhism. And so uh, it takes, you know, if you're ever gonna get into deep study of uh, Buddhism, uh, you're going to have to look at all these different branches. It's much like people who are unfamiliar with Christian history and the branches of Christianity. It looks very complicated to them as well. Uh, so here's one way of uh, looking at uh, it. This was mapped out by uh, Cordovan in his book you're reading, Neighboring Faith. Uh, you have Buddha here at the top and Theravada Buddhism is the main uh, religion that came out, that's tr traditional religion, although you might have some regional variations. But then the split occurs and you have Mahayana Buddhism, and it splits into the Vajrayana uh, 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 um, type of uh, Buddhism, which will be your uh, uh, Tibetan. But they have different schools. You got the Tendai school, which has pure land, Zen, and the Chirian. And then you have the Shingon and uh, the, uh, the Rai Bu, which has to do with Shintoism, uh, which we don't cover in this particular course. But uh, it's a helpful diagram uh, in understanding the splitting off uh, in uh, Buddhism. All right, so um, uh, we're going to stop right there and uh, pick up uh, on the third a lecture uh, on that. So let me